Thank you, MC. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to all delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker today, this morning, who is going to talk about promoting peace globally, the reviews of peace in global context. This is a topic which we should all be deeply interested because we would like to hear and share why we must promote living in a place in a peace. Due to some uh, deteriorations of conflict in some other countries in the world, happened in Egypt, Turkey, and Cyprus, Myanmar, as well as issues on refugees in Syria, Lebanon, and Libya. Our speaker is Dr. Wan Muhammad Nazrul, bin Wan Muhammad Nasir. He's a deputy dean of student development and entrepreneurship from University of Malaysia, Kelantan, Malaysia. Holding PhD in marketing and entrepreneurship from University of Victoria, Melbourne, Australia, and also a member of WPF UNESCO. So I'm a most honored and I would like to be grateful if you help me to welcome to the stage Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wan Mohamad Nazrul, Ben Wan Mohamad Nasi. Give him a round of applause. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. Distinguished guests, speakers, moderators, ladies and gentlemen, how are you today? I hope you enjoy this morning. And then for those who are still outside, may I call to come inside because I'll start very soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, today I will, I will deliver a speech on promoting peace globally, the review of peace in global context. So that is the title of my speech today. And ladies and gentlemen, what is peace actually? I'm sure that we are all have our own definition of peace. According to Albert Einstein, according to Albert Einstein, peace cannot be kept by force, it can only be achieved by understanding. So there are two main key points here actually, which is um, the force or enforcement and understanding. These elements are interrelated. All right. Even though that we have understanding among each other, there still need the existence of enforcement or the vice versa. Even though there is an enforcement, but we still need understanding between two parties actually to achieve the peace. So that is Albert Einstein's perceive of peace. And how about you? What is peace means to you? Now, let us take a look on how a group of youngsters perceive peace. Making your body be calm. If you need the space, you just scoot. Settle and quiet. When you're listening to other people. Just being calm. You can be free to be creative. Family. Harmony. A state of enlightenment. For me personally, like being asleep, like I think it's probably one of the more peaceful things you can do. Whenever you get to do exactly what you love. Community. 
Being content. Not being afraid to go where you want to go. Do what you want to do. Fulfilled. The element of being nice to someone. That you have space for yourself. Pretty. Pillows and blankets and beds. <laughs> School. It will look great. Quiet. So being able to agree on things and compromising. Taking care of your friends. Probably treating others the way that you would want to be treated. People playing. Uh, setting aside differences to uh, come together for the greater good. It would look like a place that had direct communication as a real basis. Really big trees. I feel like trees make people nicer. People think about other people before they say stuff. Just being chill with one another. Respecting everyone's opinion and not judging anyone. Holy Cabelli! I just feel so loved here and it's a big community. So uh, this video shows that how simple the, percep the perception of peace. You don't have to look uh, on the encyclopedia or dictionary for the definition of peace. Well, for me, peace is able to humbly stand here in front of you and giving this lecture. And I think for WPF, peace is when we can gather the audience, everybody today, and enjoy the convention. All right, so we can uh, move to the next slide. All right, thank you so much. Before, before we understand peace, actually, we need, we need uh, you know, a moment to revive, to remember ourselves, what is conflict, all right? So, of course, we want, we, uh, we want peace to avoid war or conflict. What is war, actually? The word war, comes to English by the old high German language word Warren, W-E-R-R-A-N. It means to confuse or to cause confusion and is a stable of open and usually declared armed conflict between political entities such as sovereign states or between rival political or social factions within the same state. Well, if we can look on the earliest conflict in history, the first point, chronicles of constant strife in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is actually the earliest civilizations. Well, in Greek, Mesopotamia means two rivers, which are Tigris and Euphrates, and exist during the fourth millennium before century. Even during that time, there are war, there are conflicts already. And the second point, pheromones conquered northern Egypt. Uh, pheromones actually exist during the early dynastic period between century 3150 to 2616 BC. All right? So it's, it's not weird actually in Egypt if there is a conflict until now because it, it start even during the earlier civilizations, all right? There was in, um, in Europeans, in Africa, how about we take a look on the Asian side, actually. Zhou Dynasty gained ascendancy through battle in 1046 before century. All right, in Asia, Zhao dynasty is one of the earliest dynasties followed by Shang dynasty and preceded by Qing dynasty. That's the story happened in Malaysia. And as well as in Europe, actually, in Europe, the success of Scipio Africanus in the defeat of Carthage in Rome between 236 to 183 before century. All right, and this is uh, now it's in Tunisia. All right, the place is the Battle of Zama in Tunisia. 
Okay, so that is the earliest conflict in history, in history that men have ever known. Okay, in modern world, in modern world, let us look on the First World War. All right. It starts. First World War starts from 28th of July 1914 until 11th of November 1918. So actually, the conflict, the war, lasted for four years, three months, and 14 days. And during that period, around 8.5 million soldiers died. And more than 13 million civilizations died, but more than that, actually, war caused huge. Um, yeah, it, it caused so many things, so many other things. All right, if we can have a look on the point number one, uh, war, the First World War starts after the assassinations of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand by South Slav nationalist Gravillo Principe on June 28, 1914. All right? There was two sides of the war, the triple extensives or the allies, Britain, France, Ireland, and Russia, and the other participants as well as Bulgaria, the France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Ottoman Empire, which is known as Turkey today, Portugal, Russia, United Kingdoms, and as well as United States. The central powers on the other side were Germany and Austria-Hungary. The result of the First World War, actually, is the collapse of imperial dynasties such as Austria-Hungary, Germany and Ottoman Empire, as well as Russia. Not just more, not, not just that actually. The introduction of the chemical weapon was first used in World War I. And due to that chemical weapon, it is said, it is mentioned that it's developed the Spanish flu that um, affected the troops and refugees. And this devastating pandemic killed almost 50 million lives, 50 million to 100 million in 1918 to 1919. All right? And this, this number is actually 3 to 5% of the world population and making it one of the deadliest natural disasters in human history. That is the result of the First World War I. First World War. All right. We can have a look on the Second World War. All right. It is known as the deadliest conflict. Just now is the bloodiest, um, well, I've mentioned uh, the deadliest natural disasters, but now is the deadliest conflict in human history. So most fatalities were civilians, in the Soviet Union and China. It included massacres, the genocide of the Holocaust, strategic bombings, premeditated death from starvation and disease, and the only use of nuclear weapon in war. The nuclear weapon started to introduce during the World War II, actually. Well, um, the World War II started after an uneasy 20 years of hiatus dispute left by World War I. And the participants are Canada, China, France, Germany, Italy, India, Japan, as well as Soviet Union, United Kingdoms, United States. So these formed two opposing military, the Allies and the Axis. In general, it, it involved more than 100 million lives, 100 million people, and as well as 30 countries. All right? So World War II started when Britain and France declare war on Germany, on which the Nazi party ruled by Hitler 
want to rule Europe and start to invade Poland. After the Nazi party invade Poland, then uh, the Britain and France declare the World War II. And it started on 1st of September 2000, I mean, 1st of September 1939, and some said that it started on 3rd of September 1939. It depends on uh, the historians, actually. Well, by summer 1941, Nazis or Germany had invaded France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Denmark, Norway, Greece, Yugoslavia, and USSR. In Asia, on the other part, Japan want to control Asia and Pacific. All right? World War II actually caused 60 to 100 million civilians who died and involved 70, more than 17 million of soldiers. The end of the World War II come when the hit, the, I mean, the, the leader of Nazi party, Adolf Hitler, suicide on 30th of April, 1945. And suddenly the power getting weakened. And seven days after the suicide of Adolf Hitler, and the less than 40 hours wife, Eva Braun or Eva Hitler, Germany unconditionally surrendered on May 7, 1945. That is on the Europe part. And, then all the, and on the Asian part, actually, the Japanese surrender on 2nd of September, 1945, which was brought by the US dropping atomic bombs on the Japanese towns of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So that event, that event happened on August 6, 1945. And the results of World War II is actually devastating. But one of the famous cases, one of the famous stories that I would like to quote here is the Anne Frank, one of the most discussed Jewish victims of the Holocaust. And she gained fame posthumously with the publication, The Diary of a Young Girl. So the diary started from June 14th, 1942 until August 1st, 1944. And it's been published more than 60 languages. So it's a heartbreaking story. If you, if you have a chance to read uh, The Diary of Anne Frank, you know how hard it's actually to live during the war, which we are now, most of us, most of us is forget all of those uh, things. All right. Um, World War II actually resulted in the beginning of the nuclear age. All right. The dissolutions of the lease of nation, the creation of United Nation, and as well as the beginning of Cold War, which lasted until 1990s. All right. However, even after the World War II last long time ago in 1945, well, let's see the face of the current world today. So due to those matters, actually, the UN was established, United Nations. All right. 
So United Nations is an international organization founded in 1945, and there are around 193 member states, members of uh, General Assembly. The first name coined by U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt during Second World War I, sorry, during the Second World War, and the role is to promote and secure international cooperation and to create and maintain international order. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the first document to detail the fundamental human right that must be protected. The Declaration was proclaimed by the General Assembly in 1948. Security of human rights are the key pillars of UN's network. The UN assists people displaced by violence, conflict, and persecution. The UN and its agencies provide life-saving help to refugees and possibly displaced people. As we can see today, there are more than 60 million forcibly displaced people. The UN brought countries together in 2015 to launch a plan to end poverty, reduce inequalities, and protect the planet by 2030. The Sustainable Development Goals provide a common blueprint for countries to reach a world of dignity for all by 2030. The organization won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001, and a number of its officers and agencies have also been awarded the prize. And it's not just United Nations, actually. The UNESCO has been established to tackle on certain issues. UNESCO, or United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, was established on November 4th, 1946. And it's, uh, it is a specialized agency for the United Nations. To contribute to peace and security in the world by promoting collaboration, among nations through education, science, culture, and communication to spread the universal respect for rule of law, freedom, and human rights. UNESCO is the agency for preservation of ancient culture and also cultural monuments. UNESCO's World Heritage Program, which helps poor countries to protect the ancient treasures was established by the U.S. in 1972 and in no way affects U.S. sovereignty or public or private property rights. It simply recognizes and supports sites and monuments of world-class beauty. And besides that, UNESCO looks to the U.S. for participations and leadership in its human rights, for, um, such as forums, and in the construction of human rights and democratic citizenship curricula in developing countries and countries in transition. UNESCO's mandate is to further universal respect for justice, the rule of law, and for the human right and fundamental freedom which are affirmed for the people of the world. All right? So we hope that these two uh, organizations is actually able to take care more problems that we are, we are facing today. Okay? Despite that, it's, um, it's better for us actually to check on the Global Peace Index. And I do have here, actually, the Global Peace Index, that is uh, the, the current one in 2018. 
This report presents the most comprehensive data-driven analysis to date on trends in peace, its economic value, and how to develop peaceful societies. As you can see, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Iraq, and Somalia comprise the remaining peaceful societies. The 2018 Global Peace Index uniquely reveals that peacefulness has a considerable impact on microeconomic performance. So that's why, actually, we are all longing for peace because of the prosperity. In the last 70 years, per capita growth has been three times higher in, high, in highly peaceful countries when compared to countries with low level of peace. Peacefulness is also correlated with strong performance on a number of microeconomic variables. Interest rates are lower and more stable in highly peaceful countries as the rate of inflation. Well, as you can look, actually, on the 2018 Global Peace Index, um, deterioration in four most peaceful regions, it shows that the state of peace is actually, you know, getting smaller, all right? Such as Europe, North America, Asia Pacific, and South America. Iceland remains the most peaceful country in the world, a position that, is held, that it has held since 2008. All right, the populations of Iceland is around 350 to 400,000. And you know, I, ironically, the difference between Iceland and Greenland is Greenland is covered by ice, wherever the Iceland actually is such a green place. All right, and in Greenland, just to 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 mention a few facts, there are around just around 50,000 uh, residents there, okay? Western European country experienced one of the five largest de deteriorations with Spain falling 10 places in the ranking to 30th, owing to internal political tensions and an increase in the impact of terrorism, all right? And at the 2018 Global Peace Index, the red, the red color signifies the most hostile place compared to the green color, which is uh, considered as the most uh, peaceful uh, place, actually. And if you can have a look, uh, Malaysia, Malaysia is still green, even though it's, it's not uh, the dark green, but we are still in peace. And it shows that during the last election, the transition of power happened in a, in a very, very smooth state, actually. And we are proud of that. As a Malaysian, we are really proud of that. All right? Okay, and in the Middle East, it been, in the Middle East, it, just to, to briefly mention that it currently encompasses the area from Egypt, Turkey, and Cyprus to the west, uh, in the west to Iran, and the Persian Gulf, in the east and from Turkey and Iran in the north to Yemen and Oman in the south. So these regions actually is a conflicted region. And they, they have some complete revolve in Syria as well, the Palestine, Iraq, the post-Arab Spring issues. So the destruction of country peace and development actually resulted in loss of lives. That is the case of Middle East, all right? This is the case of Korean Peninsula. The war ended decades ago, but fears still remain. North Korea spent billion dollars on the military assets, but citizens' life remained poor, and countries' development left far behind. But actually, to tell the truth, you know, all the facts is all based on the mass social, I mean, and, uh, according to the mass media, according to the written publications. 
we don't really know what happened there. Okay? So what being reported is what we are uh, perceived. All right? However, recently there are peace talk between U.S. President Donald Trump and King Jong-un from North Korea in Singapore. As and you can see, U.S. always take, uh, United, I mean, United States of America always take the initiative to bring peaceful among countries or maybe the vice versa. All right, so it depends. Okay, um, it's not just that. We have a look on Myanmar. All right, Myanmar is actually one of the continuous issues since last year, as the pressure been given to Rohingya community and they become the refugees. Some of the refugees are seeking shelter mostly in Bangladesh but some in Malaysia as well. And the role of UNCHR for solving vast refugee number is actually very important uh, at the current moment. All right? However, however, we look in, uh, in some perspective. This is uh, the human rights activists. The human rights activists, and all of you know Aung San Suu Kyi the human rights activist, and she said that my attitude to peace is rather based on the Burmese definition of peace. It really means revolving, removing, sorry. It, mean, it really means removing all the negative factors that destroy peace in this world. So, peace does not mean just putting an end to violence or to war, but to all other factors that threaten peace, such as discrimination, such as inequality and as well as poverty. But at this recent moment, actually, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is getting a lot of criticized from everywhere. And, you know, just a few days ago, we've heard that Amnesty International has withdrawn a prestigious human rights award from Aung San Suu Kyi and described a shameful betrayal of the values that she once stood for. And for your information, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was awarded the Ambassador of Conscience Award. And the issues the news keep on pouring daily, even at this moment of time, actually. The last news can be, you know, a few minutes ago, when people keep on pressing her and pushing her to take the issues um, of refugees uh, you know, as, as a better actions, actually. And same things with uh, North Korea that I mentioned before. We, we, we actually don't really know what, what, what's going on, the real situations over there. All right? Because, of course, Aung San Suu Kyi denied such problems. But from what reported from the media, from the social medias that we've known, there is a terrible thing happened in Myanmar that caused the Rohingya to flip the country to Bangladesh or to other countries, Nazrul, such as Malaysia. Um, you have five minutes. Thank you. All right. And still, there are some ongoing conflicts as well in the Philippines. The conflict between various militant groups and the governments which claim thousands of human life and hindered countries' development. It's under undeveloped resource and vast potential land for agriculture. It's such a waste, actually. When there is a conflict, uh, the resources are underdeveloped and it's such a waste to the nations. And these are the issues on the refugees. Can we have a look? Some issues on the refugees. Exodus of refugees from Syria, Lebanon, and Libya to Europe. Same issues like uh, the Rohingya before. Tremendous refugees problem in European countries. Burden on socioeconomic impact for the countries involved. That is the result of war or conflict that happened nowadays. So, uh, next slide, please. 
So this is actually the main point of my lecture today. All right, how we would like to promote peace. Okay, for me there are three three elements on how you can promote peace. It comes from personal, it comes from the community, and it comes from the education. All right. So we will try to promote unity, try to promote justice, and try to promote kindness as well. I am a marketing person. I taught marketing and entrepreneurship at University of Malaysia, Kelantan. And this is how I promote peace, giving lecture and education to the students or to the audience. To promote peace starts at an individual level. We are all have our own purpose or duty according to our own area or niche. Engineers, doctors, lawyers, politicians, we are all can promote peace accordingly. And how you can promote peace, ladies and gentlemen, you can ask yourself. All right, that is on the personal level. For the community level, things that you can promote peace is to become more familiar with your community. And you can plan a peaceful event, like what we have today, actually. And you can explore more volunteer opportunities. And of course, there are many more to mention. And for the education, I would like to request, ladies and gentlemen, you can visit Promote Peace Education website, P-E-A-C-E where there are many models that can we adopt. It is not a rocket science, actually. Peace is not a rocket science. It's just on how we can implement at our educational system or at our curricula. It's all about mixing the peace element in our systems. All right, uh, just a little bit more. All right, the next slide, please. The significance of peace and proper. This is uh, nothing strange to us, actually. When we uh, gain peace, these are the things that we can enjoy, that we can benefit. The first one is the revert usage of money spent on military purposes to social, one, uh, social well-being, to the physical development of the country, to education, or to other economic activities. And also, we can enhance life quality in drug and hunger-stricken countries like Somalia, Ethiopia, and etc. actually. So the money that's supposed to spend on military, you can move to that, uh, to that part. And it also will create conducive relations between nations and love among the nationalities. And last but not least, of course, it will encourage people to move freely among nations, create opportunities for global tourism activities, economic activities, and as well as the cultural exchanges that has been promoted by UNESCO. All right? And a little bit of words of wisdom, all right? Actually, in every races or in every religion, they are all promoting peace, all right? And these are the words of wisdom from Surah of Al-Baqarah 190 to 191. And I also would like to quote some word of wisdom from a very famous person that sounds very simple. Of course, it is simple. What can, she said that, what can you do to promote world peace? And the answer is, go home and love your family. It gives us a very deep and big meaning, actually. Peace starts from home. For the children to enjoy a nice upbringing in a good family, I think they are able to become the next generation that value peace and able to promote peace themselves as well. As what mentioned by Eleanor Roosevelt, it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. 
another quote from Mahatma Gandhi. An eye for an eye only ends up making world blind. And I'm sure you can translate in many ways. So what is peace to you? So today, I would like to conclude that peace is an ongoing issue and worth to discuss and to promote and to learn from each other in making sure the survival of the next generation. That's all for my speech today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just in time, Dr. Azrul. Right, uh, please. Thank you, Dr. Wanazrul, for enlightening presentation on promoting peace globally. Peace is on ongoing issues and worth to discuss, promote, and learn from each other in making sure the survival of next generations. So as been proposed, there are three ways to promote peace is through personal, community, and education. So since we have a limited of time, we, I open only two questions from the floor, if anyone things to share, to comment, and probably, you know, give some ideas on uh, issues related on peace. Yeah. Please go to the nearest. Uh, yes, please, sir. Thank you. Hello. Assalamualaikum and very good morning. My name is Azman. I'm an engineer by profession. Okay. Uh, let's talk about peace as opposed to wars and conflicts. However, historically, we have seen that war and conflicts has sparked the innovation of technology. For example, during the Cold War, we've seen the highest level of human achievement when we send humans to the moon. So my question to you, Dr. Wan, do you think in a peace-only environment, there will be the similar kind of push and spark in terms of technology innovation. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that uh, very nice gentleman. Well, it's a very tricky question, actually. Um, he mentioned that during the war and conflict, we innovate and create something for benefits of human life. Is it, is it true? All right. So, instead of peace, are we able to come up with such uh, innovations or such technology, actually? Well, the answer is quite simple for me. Um, yeah, of course, humans, when they face some problem, they tend to have something to solve the problem. All right? So, when there is war, which is the problem, and you need something to solve the problem that, I mean, occurred during the war. All right. But I think in peace, in the state of peace, even though there is no conflict or there is no war, there still, can, uh, there still uh, an innovation can be created. But maybe on the other, on the other sense, actually. So it does not need war or conflict so that we can innovate on or that we can achieve something. All right, thank you. Any, any more questions? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Muhammad Shah Muhammad. I'm a student PhD student at the University Technology Malaysia. All right. So my question is, uh, the difference between peace and instability, to my understanding, instability leads to war or it destroys peace. So it is very it is important to focus. So most of the, you know, narrative is or, or literature on global conflicts, I see that they focus on peace. And if you put all these findings into an end and establish a, a peace, then there is no stability. So how to uh, create a peaceful environment 
without compromising stability. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, well, uh, sir, I need to understand uh, your question. So the question is how we can create peace. All right. Can 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 you repeat? Can you repeat uh, the questions, please? So my question is this: peace and step and instability are different. Peace and instability yeah, are instability. different. Yes. Yeah. Still, you see some countries, they are very peaceful and they are not stable. And to my understanding, instability is the major cause of that destroys peace. So why international interventions focus on peace rather than instability? All right, okay, all right. Well, uh, it, it's really a good question. Uh, to answer your question, I would quote that I would say that uh, for every sovereignty or for every country, they have their own laws, and sometimes this international program, they cannot just jump into that country and you know solve the conflict that happened. We can give them pressure, but we can directly stir the you know the rules or the law or the things that happen inside the sovereignty or inside the, the country. So instead of we taking care of instability, we try to promote peace because we thought that peace is actually can cool down the instability. I think that makes sense rather than we, we tried so hard, I mean, from the outside to solve the instability of a certain uh, community or certain uh, countries, actually. Thank you. All right, can I output? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, can you go to the nearest microphone there, at the back? Okay. Uh, you get one there in the middle also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Darby. I'm a pensioner. Uh, so speaker, uh, just now you quoted Surah Al-Baqarah, where the opening verse was that, fight in the way of Allah. Do you think that the present attack by Saudi Arabia, the guardian of the Holy Land of Mecca, on Yemen, on Yemen is a fight in the way of Allah? Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I, I don't get your name just now, a, a very nice gentleman over there. All right, okay. We are actually confuse our fights for religion, our fight for Islam, and as well as our fights, uh, I mean, for the sake of politics or for the sake of powers. So which one of which most of us actually tend to mix everything up? So sometimes people quote in Islam, you know, but the action is actually towards the terrorism. Islam that I know is only teaches the values of virtuous, value of peace. All right? So I think it's, 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 totally, uh, it, it's totally not actually the, the teaching of Islam to invade the other countries, but maybe because of the desire, the other desire, the political, the powers, or we, we never know what, what's going there. But all that we should know is that the values for every religion is all about promoting peace. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Probably give me one last question before we move to the next speakers. Is there anyone? One last question. Yes, sir. The nearest microphone there. Hello, Assalamualaikum. I'm Amin from Kotawaru. So you just said the three things to promote peace is one by individual, second is by community, 
And the third one is the education. So my questions for you is, uh, what kind of education that educate peace? Yeah, that's it. All right. Well, uh, j just now, Mr. from Kotobaru. Um, I'm, I'm from Kotobaru myself, actually, and we live, we are so lucky to live in a peaceful state, and we, are, can, we, we still can enjoy nasi lemak or nasi blau that just cost us two dollars, I mean two ringgit. You know, it's very cheap compared to what you can have in Kuala Lumpur. All right, so the three ways to promote peace starts from personal, community, and education is actually the simplest ways. There are hundred and thousand ways that we can promote peace. But if you understand these three basic ways, I think we can explore more. Throughout the educations, it starts at home. As mentioned by uh, Mother Teresa just now, how you can promote peace? Just go back and love your family. So the family institution is very important and how the government able to supply these values throughout the children, throughout the families, is something that worth to think about, actually. It's easy for us to adapt some curricula or some uh, programs, but we need to understand deeper, deeper than that, actually. So I think peace has been taught in many ways, but how you can promote peace According to the small children that age between three to five years old, as you've seen in the uh, videos just now, it's a very significant. Because what the children believe, you know, they will carry with them until they are grown up. And it's very important because they will become the next generation, they will become the next leaders, the next world leaders. And if, don't, if they don't get the values right, we are all going to be in troubles, actually. We might not live up to 50 years, but the children at the age of five or six years old, they will continue to live for more than 50 or 60 years from now. So it's very important to promote peace at that stage, at that level, actually. And it's supposed to start at home. I think, I think that that's the way it is. It's just, just my perception, my five cents. Of thought. Thank you so much. Well done, Dr. Nazrul. He's a brilliant young man. <laughs> right, give him a round of applause anyway. All right, um, we give away for the next uh, presenter. So, MC, be back to you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the first paper presentation. We would like to thank Dr. Wan Muhammad Nazrul bin Wan Muhammad Nasir, Senior Lecturer in University Malaysia, Kelantan, for being the presenter. And we also would like to thank Dr. Jati Kasuma bin Ali from UITM Sarawak for taking the role as moderator for the session. As a token of appreciation, we would like to invite Honorable Saudara Muhammad Hafizul Datuk Ahmad, Head World Philosophical Forum Malaysian National Branch, to present souvenirs as a token of appreciation to both. Please welcome. And first, please welcome Dr. Wan Muhammad Nazrul bin Wan Muhammad Nasir to receive the souvenir. And next, Please welcome Dr. Jati Kasuma bin Ali to receive the souvenir. We would like to thank Saudara Muhammad Hafizul Datuk Ahmad for presenting the souvenirs. <laughs> 